Okay, today we're going to be looking at the continuation of the French Revolution. As always, let's start with the big ideas. Um, first one, explain how uh, the political crisis of 1789 led to popular revolts. And the second one is the big unit idea we've been looking at, which is identify the causes and consequences of major political revolutions. So from there, let's get started. Uh, we're going to be looking at July 14th, 1789. For the most part, we've been focusing on the National Assembly, which has been meeting in Versailles, which is kind of a more rural uh, city just outside of Paris. Uh, but for this, we're actually going to be looking at Paris itself and what's going on there. Um, in Paris, there's this building known as the Bastille. It's kind of like a medieval prison uh, located in the heart of Paris. And... On July 14th, 800 Parisians are gathered outside the Bastille. Uh, we can think of them as being part of the Third Estate. Uh, and they're demanding weapons and gunpowder. Uh, and what happens is the mob is going to be able to break through the gate, overrun um, the commander and some of the guards, killing some of them. And they actually release hundreds of prisoners. And a the big reason why this is important is the Bastille to the third estate, especially the urban poor and even rural peasants, was a symbol of the abuse that the king and the monarch, uh, the monarchy had committed over the years. And so we can see tensions boiling over and leading to this march on this symbol uh, of complete oppression. Um, about a month later. Uh, uh, in 1789, uh, we've been looking at um, the terrible famine that had hit. I mentioned it last time. Bad harvests uh, had kind of struck France, which did not help anything. You had starving peasants, and for the people that still had a job, some of them were spending 80% of their income just on bread. So on August 4th, uh, the National Assembly is going to meet, and some members of the Second Estate, some of the nobles, agree to give up privileges, privileges that they had held and had been passed down for centuries. Uh, some of these included the manorial dues that peasants paid to them, no longer there. Uh, their special legal status was gone, and their exemption from taxes that they had uh, received for many years was now gone too. So it, it really shows that some of the nobles were willing to sacrifice some things in, in order to make France better. Uh, and this is going to lead to um, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And um, we kind of consider this France's first step towards a written constitution to kind of control the king. Uh, and it's modeled after the Declaration of Independence, which was written 13 years prior to it. And it proclaimed some, um, some basic Enlightenment ideas, the ideas that all men were born and remained free and equal in rights. And along with that, it provided for the right to liberty, prosperity, or property, security, and resistance to oppression. And if we think back to the start of this unit when we were talking about the Enlightenment um, and John Locke, the Declaration of the Rights of Man also proclaims that the government exists to protect the natural rights of citizens. And that's really it. So they're really getting back to some of those Enlightenment ideas that had influenced the American and the American Revolution and are now influencing the French Revolution. And the final thing we're going to look at today is the new constitution, which is adopted in 1791 in France. And what it does is it institutes a limited monarchy, meaning there's still a king, but the king now has to abide by some rules. It's no longer an absolute monarchy, which gave the king total power. Um, it created a legislative assembly, and, and this assembly could make laws, collect taxes, and had war-making powers, very similar to the United States Congress. Um, some other things to note, only tax-paying males over the age of 25 could vote. Um, along with that, a, a major step was it ended church interference um, really in government at the time. If we think back, the church and the clergy were the first estate. They were pretty much the highest up besides the king. And overall, it reflected the Enlightenment ideas of the time. 
So as we look, we now see uh, John Locke and his Enlightenment ideas and some others, Rousseau and Montesquieu, their ideas not only influencing the American Revolution, but also the French Revolution as well. So if we wrap that up for today and look at our big ideas again, first was explain how the political crisis of 1789 led to popular revolts. Think about the taxes. Think about the famine that's going on. Just the overall unfairness in society. And then identify the causes and consequences of major political revolutions. Obviously, this is something we continue to look at, uh, and hopefully you're starting to understand more and more of these causes and consequences.